Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kieran Smith, the Director of Solutions Consulting at Telium. Telium is trusted by organizations and universities globally to collect, enrich, protect, and activate their most valuable customer data in real time. We're here today to explore some of the challenges facing universities in Australia, particularly around student intake and the proposed reforms to the Australian Privacy Act. Our goal for the session is to equip you with strategies and insight to effectively navigate these evolving changes. We're going to uh, converse about first party data and segmentation and how it can play a crucial role in helping universities adjust to the current landscape. We'll discuss acquisition and retention strategies and dive into the balance of paid and owned media approaches, exploring both the strategic and the operational changes that can make a difference. We'll also touch on the role a customer data platform plays offering the ability to unify customer data and improve targeting and personalization efforts. Throughout the session, if you have any questions, please submit them through in the question box and we'll aim to answer these towards the end of the session. Without further ado, I'm delighted to be joined by our amazing panel of data experts and I'll allow them each to introduce themselves, starting with Leanne. Good morning and welcome, Leanne. Hi, how are you? Thanks, Kieran. Um, my name is Leanne Towsey. I'm from Griffith University and my role is um, Associate Director of Marketing Technology with a primary focus on prospective domestic student acquisition. Um, and I'll throw over to Alex. Leanne, thanks, Kieran. So, Alex, uh, I lead the vertical business here in Australia, uh, part of the Ogilvy One network of agencies. I have the pleasure of being a Tilium partner spending a bunch of time working in the higher education sector, particularly around the use of CDPs, but also data and journeys and all those fun things, and also work very closely with our colleagues in the media world. And I will pass to Nick. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nick Hinchley. So I'm the head of data and technology at SS Mediacom, uh, obviously one of the agencies within the group M stable. Uh, so my job is, is very much working with our clients to help them enable data and technology um, through their media um, efforts as well. So working closely with the guys here at Telium and, and also Alex and the, uh, the team at Ogilvy as well. Fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. Let's kick straight off with the first question. Uh, the first question is, what are the challenges specifically in recruiting and engaging with students today in the current landscape? Um, and maybe just telling us some of the strategies you're implementing to overcome these. Uh, Leanne, would you mind kicking us off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the challenges today are probably similar across many um, industries. They're both well, economic, um, technological and regulatory are the biggest ones that are playing a part on what we're doing. So domestically, we're seeing competition from other universities, of course, but also from non-traditional players, such as the private colleges, online um, courses, and a lot of short course providers as well. Um, so I guess there's been a societal sort of shift towards bite-sized learning as well. So um, a lot of the strategies universities are trying to implement is just looking at what their degree structures are, um, how they can modify some of the courses they offer, whether that be pathways into the university if people aren't coming from traditional high school um, path to university, uh, bridging courses, double degrees, vertical degrees, um, short courses, and you know online, offline sort of learning as well. Um, so it's about support services that go with that as well. So making sure that we're assisting students with what they want to achieve, um, as well as delivering the best quality education that we can for them. Fantastic. And Alex and, and Nick, have you got anything to add to uh, how you see these changes affecting both of your roles? Yeah, definitely maybe I can kick off there, Kieran, yeah. as well. I very much agree. There's, I think, some really key changes that affect the audiences here. So as I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, the student audiences we're talking to are changing significantly over time uh, in terms of what they expect of an education experience, as Liam was talking about. You've got different options available to you. Uh, the steps they go through in terms of making their decisions have changed. And where we're seeing the biggest changes is or challenges are uh, how universities who are typically not the fastest moving type of organization are able to pivot and sort of move to where the audience is to what they're thinking be it in terms of the role marketing plays be it in terms of how technology is used a whole bunch of things there um, where we're seeing really strong wins for clients in this space is where they are able to really get student first and actually where marketing gets to play a bit of a bigger role in taking that customer voice back to the business for things like product development that Leanne's referring to, things like that. So some really 
interesting and exciting times to be in marketing as well. Nick? Yep. Um, just to kind of build on a couple of those points, yeah, especially when it comes to from a media perspective, we've, you know, we've now got kind of broader, bigger audiences as we're talking to kind of a wider cohort of people. And uh, we've seen obviously quite a lot of media fragmentation over kind of the last five, 10 years, which is reflected kind of from those younger audiences right through to the old ones. So um, when you're trying to obviously engage with them through media, you, you know, you're now looking at kind of multiple different channels, multiple different ways to, to speak to them. Um, and we're finding that these audiences want to be um, spoken to, especially, you know, from a media perspective in different ways. So again, all that adds in kind of challenges there. So not only are we, you know, now navigating multiple different channels and platforms, but we're also having to change our approach on each of those channels and platforms as well to speak to, to those students, prospective students, um, in the way that, you know, is engaging and that, that they're um, open to. Um, so again, yeah, kind of lots of uh, challenges there, but, um, you know, kind of why we're all here in the industry is to, to solve that and, and you know, find new ways to, to speak to those people. Fantastic. Um, I guess, first of all, just looking at the international student uh, changes um, and with less international students potentially studying here in Australia, how can universities use technology and data to adapt to these changing student behaviours? Uh, and engaging with them on different channels. Um, Alex, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah, happy to. Uh, I've had the pleasure of spending a bunch of time working with the international space. I think it's, A, obviously, are there changes? Even if there aren't, there's still a lot of things we see universities either wanting or needing to do. Um, really the biggest thing, though, be it international or domestic, that we see around the use of technology and data is actually understanding that audience. So what are they doing? Almost very traditional journey design, journey mapping, those sort of pieces that allow you to understand what are the behaviors? What and where hence am I going to engage with someone? Uh, what are the types of channels? So from a, a customer data platform point of view, what do I need to plug in? What's data needs to come in? How do I need to outreach to people? Some of those things are, are really simple. Um, in concept. That said, the biggest challenge, I'd refer to sort of what I mentioned before, is for institutions to be able to think student first as opposed to organisation first. And I think the simplest example there is always email, whereas it's so common to see, and again, universities are just an example, definitely the only type of organisation that does this, that says, we want to communicate with you through email, therefore we will. That's convenient for us. Uh, as opposed to going, right, what are the channels that are right ones that are going to impact you at these particular times with these types of messages or content? Um, there's a whole bunch of barriers and challenges that you know, potentially prevent some people using other channels. So again, we spend a lot of time, how do you break those barriers down? How do you overcome those challenges, be it content, be it connecting to a media channel, what have you? That covers where you're looking for there, Kieran? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's super important to think about that. Um, Nick, have you got anything to add? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, we, we're talking specifically, obviously, around kind of international students, but it, it kind of broadens out to, you know, a challenge most clients and, and organisations are facing at the moment, which is, you know, trying to do more with less. And I think data and technology has a, a huge opportunity to play in there. Um, we're finding kind of, you know, among many of our clients, um, we have, we've been challenged to kind of, get more out of the existing kind of infrastructure, the data they've got. And there's, there's a lot you can do um, just by kind of having that really solid understanding of who your customers actually are. So when I go back to Alex's point, it's kind of moving from being, you know, almost less customer centric to being more customer centric and using the data and technology that's available or um, that's out there in market um, to really understand who, who your customers are, especially as they kind of continue to change and evolve over time. Um, the more information you can find there, obviously, the easier then it becomes to develop strategies on how to, you know, engage with them, be that through, you know, the right media channel or the right owned comms as well. So, um, yeah, there's definitely like, yeah, a lot they can do and, and, and you know, le leveraging things like CDP um, just to kind of really build up that rich in-depth understanding of, of customers and how they're interacting with, with the organisation or brand. Yeah, so there's a bit of a shift, obviously, between third-party data and first-party. Um, just on that point, um, Nick, how can universities leverage their first-party data today to enhance student acquisition and retention strategies, um, especially when we're looking at both um, paid and owned media channels? So where do they start? What do, what do they focus on? 
Yeah, um, so I think you, you mentioned it before, we're, we're, we're definitely seeing a shift from kind of those third party, second party data sources to first party data. Um, and I think, like I said, starting off with that really kind of um, solid understanding of who, you, who your customers are and the audience segments that exist within that. Um, again, we spoke to kind of within the first question that, especially within universities, those audiences are kind of changing from just being kind of, you know, your high school leavers to people at kind of all stages in life. Um, so the first step is definitely kind of being able to understand those audiences, build them out into segments using kind of first party data. And that can be, you know, anything from kind of the courses they're studying, um, demographics, but all the way through to kind of, you know, behavior on site and how they're interacting with, with websites and um, content on site. That's very much the starting point. Um, and then it's, you know, using that um, typically as a seed audience um, to kind of build out a better understanding of perspective, especially when, you know, we're talking to kind of prospective new students in acquisition. Um, you want to use kind of the understanding you have of your current customers to go out and find people who are, you know, very similar to them, more likely to be um, engaging with your brand and organization. And then from a retention perspective, um, obviously, you know, again, the more you understand about how people are, uh, are, are navigating with the brand and organization, the better it is to be able to kind of speak to them at their different stages through the journey, either kind of to keep them engaged with the university um, or to kind of, you know, hopefully prevent anyone from dropping out um, and um, falling kind of out of the system. So um, very much, yeah, building up an understanding of the, of the audience segments, how they're interacting, and then using that to either find new customers or keep them engaged with the brand. Fantastic. And then Leanne, from your side, like hands-on tools, um, what, what are you doing in your space? Um, so I think one of the important things we need to do is just bridge that gap between our owned um, channels and our paid channels so that they are getting that seamless experience. Um, retention's a big one. So, you know, being able to predict when somebody might um, have an issue and need assistance or whether they just need to push in the right direction. So timely, personalised information is important. So for us, that is definitely using our zero and first party data. We've got a lot of it as an organisation. Um, it's about having the right systems in place where we can bring those offline and online sources together to get that overall picture of the customer. And then being able to activate that in our um, social channels as well um, with good match rates. Um, our audiences are quite small, so it really is reliant on us having great um, relationships with our media um, buying companies as well so that they can understand what we're trying to achieve and help us achieve it and think about things in different ways. Fantastic. And then over to Alex, um, maybe a little bit deeper into some of the specific tactics uh, in leveraging first party data, maybe in the media channels, um, social media paid. What, what are you seeing? Sure. To a degree, very much what Nick and Leanne are talking about there. Um, for, for media, for example, or for even just the use of first party data, we typically see two general categories. One that tends to be the first thought is personalization. So how do you use this information to personalize experience, particularly in your own channels? Like for example, you've got potentially richer information to personalize. And by personalize, it could just be the timing or the content that goes to an audience through email or another wow. channel. The bigger one that Nick mentioned though, is that use of a seed audience to actually scale your audiences elsewhere. That's a really big one that I guess my point of view is a lot of organizations don't think about or realize because the thought is first party data equals personalization, but it can equal a lot more. Um, and then the retention part as well. That's so interesting in terms of what you can activate. That concept that, again, because we're talking CDP to a degree here as well, CDP is often thought about as acquisition of how do you leverage it for media to acquire customers? How do you help with a conversion funnel? Um, but essentially all those same concepts around I've got really interesting data about someone, as the end said first, and zero party type of data, but I can build up a profile, I can create models around, leverage models around and then activate to say a welfare team or just with a message and communication, whatever it might be. Um, we're starting to see thought of, uh, not seeing a lot of it in the sector, mostly because I say CDP as an example has been used historically for acquisition as opposed to other parts. It's more a bit of a maturity curve, I'd say, for institutions moving down that path. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think um, if we think about then uh, moving data to new technologies, diversifying the different channels that we're working in, 
Um, and then we've also got, you know, these changes that are impacting the organization. Uh, if we go back to your point um, earlier, Leanne, on, you know, the changes to the university and, and potentially how budget cuts and staff reductions are impacting the university uh, and how you're adapting to these tough economic times. We're getting the constant message of we need to do more with less. Um, if we need to focus on what matters and what doesn't matter, stop doing the things that don't matter. Um, but it's very hard to simply just go, okay, we're not going to do 75% of what we used to do. Um, the available hands on deck is a lot less. So it's about looking at what technology we've got, making sure we've got the right technology, we've filled those gaps um, and using it to the best of our ability. And a lot of that is data insights. Often you you know focus on a big term project as opposed to short um, quick wins, and I think there's a big shift around incremental improvements um, and doing tiny things that make a little bit of difference that builds up to a, a large difference. So, you know, at the end of the day, one of the most important things is our IT department's not delivering the results alone. The marketing team's not delivering the results alone. It's about that cross collaboration. So it starts to rationalize the workload across the organization and eliminate some of that duplication that occurs in um, big organizations. It's not easy to do. Um, and I think there's a big piece to play with investing in our actual staff, making sure that they've trained and understand how to use the technology to the best of the ability um, and feel empowered to actually make um, on the fly decisions and be led by the data and not held back by, oh, this isn't the way we do it. So a bit of agility, a bit of um, learning, um, and that makes the team empowered to actually try things. Yeah, it seems like there's, um, you know, more business units in an organisation that are able to benefit from access to data, um, whether it's, you know, IT or marketing, but also legal and privacy now have a voice in the room as well. Um, and on that subject, um, we think about, you know, there's less data, uh, there's less students. Uh, we need to be able to move data to different channels and, and test and try different things. But specifically on the potential and proposed uh, Australian privacy reforms, Leanne, what are you doing? Have you or are you preparing for these proposed reforms? Everyone is preparing. Um, our legal teams are working on writing policies. Our data governance teams are working on how it will come together. Technology teams are looking at what needs to be in place there. Um, the marketing team also, we're all looking at how we can use our PII data appropriately and to make sure that it's secure when we are activating it in different channels. Um, so CDP for us is a key player, as you could probably guess. Um, it gives us that consent management. It gives us the opt-in, opt-out sort of um, activities that we need, as well as the security consideration when we're transferring data between different systems. Um, so, you know, it's great to be um, having a CDP that is evolving along with those laws. Um, we've got more than just the Australian data privacy regulations to consider as well, because we do play in other markets. So it's a global um, issue, depending on where you are as to which um, laws you need to apply. So centralising that consent management, the opt-in, opt-out is what's fundamental for our success, I think. Really interesting. Um, let's hone in a little bit around some of the uh, the strategies. Um, how can you create a data driven uh, data driven personalization strategy that enhances student experiences while also honouring privacy and consent and being compliant? Um, maybe Leanne, if you could continue on that one just a little bit more, and then we'll throw it to Alex and Nick. I think the most important thing is transparency. If you want something of somebody, you need to tell them why you're asking for it, what you're going to do with that information and what benefit it is to them. Um, if they know why you want something, then they're more inclined to provide it. Um, and if you don't need it, don't ask for it. So also, you know, be really clear in the opt-in, opt-out. They might be interested for a short while. They might not be for a while. Um, give them that ability to decide if they do want to continue getting information from you. and. I think the most important thing is what we've discussed in all the previous questions is just know the audience, know what they want, segment them, target them specifically to what their needs are. You should be able to, as a student, we've had so many students go before them, preempt what it is they need to know. So the more you know about them and the more targeted you can be in the information you're providing, the more benefit it is to both parties. Fantastic. Alex or Nick, um, I'm going to throw to Alex next. What are your thoughts? I probably won't be long here because I actually don't have a lot to add. I think what Leanne has shared there is absolutely spot on. Right? Where, where we're seeing organisations do work is really data strategy, which ties 100% to what Leanne's talking about is, do you know 
why you're collecting information, what you're collecting, what you're going to do with it, how the technology then wraps around that as well to make sure that, yes, that piece of work that legal is put together or data governance is put together is actually executed in systems because that can be a big challenge sometimes. Um, but, yeah, I, I simply couldn't agree more. Nick? Yeah, and Leanne did a, a very good job there. I think, um, yeah, a couple of things that you know, we're kind of talking about and, look, and looking at is, is when you kind of consent um, and kind of, you know, to Leanne's point, like making sure that you, you're being kind of transparent with any data you are collecting on customers and how it's going to be used. So um, we're finding, you know, as long as customers are consenting in and opting in to, to having that data used, then in most cases they are quite happy for it to be used for personalization or, or in segmentation. Um, so that's kind of key. Um, there are also kind of other areas we can start looking as well um, in terms of things like data collaboration. So um, obviously leveraging your own zero and first party data, but then looking at how you're working with kind of selected and um, uh, kind of sensible partners um, that also have kind of data that you can access on your consumers as well to find out broader insights. Um, and then another big thing is, is um, you know, not all first party data has to be PII. So it doesn't always have to be, you know, using emails, using personal details. There's a lot of first party data that businesses and organizations have, um, such as, you know, just general actions on a, on a website that can be used to build out kind of really robust kind of data driven strategies without having to kind of lean on emails, phone numbers, things like that. So again, don't just think first party data is PII. There's a lot out there that, that also can be used to, to build out those strategies, especially when you're you're know, talking around kind of personalization, um, things people are doing on site and stuff like that. Yeah. And maybe just honing in a little bit deeper on that one, um, Nick, in terms of uh, privacy regulations coming in, mm -hmm. which means we're getting potentially less data because it's not consented. Um, and then we're using multiple different channels for activation, which are new channels like the TikToks and the Snapchats and the mm -hmm. you know, metas of the world. Um, what are some specific tactics that are useful for organizations to ensure that they're getting the best return on investment in those channels? Um, I've got a, a few thoughts on something that I wanted to see in there, <coughs> conversions APIs, um, but just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what you think is important and why. Yeah, I think, well, I think you've already mentioned kind of one of the key things that, um, again, we're talking to, to clients around. So as we're moving kind of from from third party cookies, um, obviously kind of the old ways we were able to build our audiences and kind of, you know, drive those efficiencies with, with, with the use of pixels. Most of those are obviously primarily built on the on the use of third party cookies. So we need to start moving away from that into things like conversion API and, and server side signals. Um, so, again, just preserving those signals that we can put into those those performance platforms. Um, without the use of third-party cookies. So, um, again, um, Convergence API, Events API, they all seem to have kind of slightly different name for it, but it's essentially, you know, passing through um, some of that customer information to the platform to help inform them from optimization and measurement perspective. Um, so where third-party cookies aren't present or app blockers are in place, we're still being able to give those platforms rich signals based on kind of first-party consented first-party data. Um, to be able to go out and kind of find those audiences and, and deliver those ads. So that's, yeah, that's definitely kind of, again, a hot topic we're speaking to many, many kind of clients about at the moment. Yeah, I think if you talk about, you know, using first party data without PII, I think that's useful within an organization where they can potentially build out some ML and AI models and create predictions and things like that. But the media channels, they're all doing the same thing with huge amounts of data. Um, mm -hmm. Alex, What's your thoughts on uh, the whole conversions APIs and the benefit in getting that consented first party data through to those channels? To a degree, I'd also wink at Nick around this and get a bit more in. But from my, from my side, there's a couple of things. Uh, one, with using those channels and particularly leveraging a CDP to activate audiences there, um, we had touched on it earlier, the match rates uh, are super important in terms of how effective that is. and one of your really simple ways of upping that is leveraging something like a conversion API yeah. to ensure you're going to get you know, that coming through so you can actually reach those people where you want to reach them or, or find those audiences you want to find. Um, because I've definitely seen examples of organizations that have not used that and have been very surprised that they've got a big audience here and there's not the same audience when they actually go and reach the channel. Uh, so doing anything you can do to improve that, that that's definitely the biggest upside I've seen there. Fantastic. And Leanne, are you all set up with all of these new connections to all these channels? Where are you at in your journey? 
Sorry, having an issue on my unmuting. Um, yes, we are currently underway with connecting a lot of our um, social channels via um, CAPI, so it is a work in progress and we have seen improved match rates on those channels. Um, like Alex said, it's essential for us because as we progress through the pipeline, our audience sizes aren't massive, so we need good match rates um, in order to reach those and to build out the seed audiences. I'm going to throw to a question that's come through, which is pretty relevant, I think. Um, wondering which channel you find most effective for local student acquisition. So I'm not sure who wants to answer that without giving away too much information or too much uh, strategy and uh, IP. Uh, Alex? Oh. Well, Leanne, you want to kick off? I was yeah, say, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, it depends on the audience. So a lot of our audiences vary from high school students to non-school leavers to, you know, research higher degree sort of students. So it is very dependent on who you're targeting and the demographics of those audiences. We've seen a big shift from, you know, mainstream, you know, Facebook would now hit your grandparents sort of age. Um, it's sort of that shift down to Instagram and some of the um, networking channels, Twitch and things like that are playing a bigger part in um, the younger audiences moved on to sort of community based channels. So again, it's about assessing what um, channels are available, what you can connect to and get good match rates on, and then how you can leverage that to target exactly who you want to target with that specific me message. So there's probably no one channel. All channels, <laughs> depending yeah. on which. Maybe I was going to say, build on that with just, just that building on what you've said earlier, and that there's not one channel. It's also, the, it depends in terms of when and what you're talking about. It's not like there's a single channel for every purpose. The idea that a few of us have talked about of understanding what that prospective student is doing when dictates the channel to a large degree. So definitely multi-channel, omni-channel. Yeah. I can I, I can add to that, but I, yeah, kind of just agree. I think um, again, we're seeing different channels work very well with different audiences, but also um, a lot of the time it's about kind of really making sure that those individual channels are done well. Like there's ways to do channels and there's ways to really lean in. Um, a good example is obviously you know TikTok is huge at the moment, but people are really leaning into specific types of content and content delivered in a kind of really authentic and engaging way there. So if you're cracking that and kind of speaking to those audiences in the way they want to be spoken to on those platforms, they can be really strong kind of acquisition drivers. But again, you know, everyone is kind of struggling, kind of struggling with that cracking, doing it well, um, especially um, in, you know, organizations like universities where it's typically a bit more kind of, um, serious content and kind of, you know, bigger life decisions versus, you know, you have kind of other brands that can kind of lean into a bit more kind of the humorous side and the, the kind of funny, lighthearted stuff. So, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it must be tough because there are all these new channels. Um, I hadn't even heard of Twitch until recently, and that's maybe just showing my age a little bit. Um, but I guess from an organization perspective, Leanne, that must mean that the team that uh, trying to connect to these channels and leverage these channels, they need to know how they work. Um, they need to be able to try different things. Uh, how does it affect the, the the team structure and the you know how do you figure all these new channels out? That's where people like Nick come into play. Um, you know, we really rely on our um, agencies to a degree is to help inform us, help work out whether or not we have the data appropriate for that channel um, and see how that we, we can leverage or do something different that we haven't done before from a traditional campaign down to, you know, short, sharp, snappy content. Um, so very much relying on our partners to assist us there. And, and Nick, I mean, it must be, you know, you've got a quite a large team, but you have yeah. to have the skills and and the proof in the pudding before you invest in these channels. What, what do you guys Yeah, do? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, we're, we're obviously fortunate as an agency. We have kind of, you know, multiple clients that we can take kind of um, insights and learnings from. But every time we're, we're looking to test anything new, be that kind of a new channel, a new strategy, um, we're really kind of looking at instilling kind of a, a really robust test and learn framework. I'm just setting up a test to actually uh, one, make sure we can get kind of really clear insight of whether that channel or strategy is working. Um, and two, um, you know, we always want to show that it's kind of providing you know, incrementality to kind of our other channel strategies or anything else we're doing. So, um, you know, we're now fortunate in a in an era where um, modeling um, used to take kind of weeks, days, you know, for, you know, quite, you know, 
advanced data sciences to work through. With the use of data and technology now, we can actually do kind of, you know, medium mix modeling and MMM models quite quickly and, and rapidly. Um, and we're really, you know, leveraging those a lot of the time to kind of set up these tests and learns and quickly prove out effectiveness of new channels and strategies. So it's all about kind of embracing that, yeah, that test and learn mentality, having a real rigor behind it um, and kind of you know, quickly moving through those tests. Yeah, and then I guess from an organization perspective, you know, if you're investing in these new channels, you have to convince your, your higher ups that it's the right thing to do. So Leanne, maybe just elaborate a little bit further on that sort of test and learn approach, how it affects you and getting buy-in from key stakeholders in the university. Yeah, and there's also the privacy part of it as well. So you've got to make sure that, you know, as you add a new channel, does it meet our requirements? Um, and that, again, CDP comes into play there of what we can connect to and trust that the information we're passing is um, hashed and protected for the user. Um, but also to try a new platform, it doesn't need to be a big brand campaign per se. There's a lot of small things you can do and you can start using just like Nick was saying, just test it. Let's try it on this campaign. Um, and some of the big wins we get across some of the platforms is simple things of when they've taken that action is the suppression. So stop serving the ads and we're starting to be able to then offer next, next best um, action or next action that they should take having completed that first one and start to target them with the next message. So you're progressing them through that pipeline. Um, and that's where the benefit comes from. Um, there's international platforms as well. Um, like I said, I'm in the domestic um, prospective student um, play area. So um, we haven't explored those as much as what our international partners probably have. Um, so I'll let Alex comment on some of those channels. I can. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the, the good thing about all those channels is you do have control. Right? You, you have a control about what data goes out, what data comes in, and there's a, a line in between to protect yourself. So there's there's often a lot of concern from legal teams, particularly around you know, what data goes where, uh, and it's usually just a matter of understanding what protection sits in place through the technology. Um, you have so many channels. Uh, all good, depending on which audience you're going after when. Yeah, and then there's obviously content for each channel, right? So kind of back to the... You know, we've got the different channels we want to try. We also have to figure out the right content, the right message. Um, sounds like it's getting harder, not easier. Um, is that a fair, fair comment? Um, I'm just going to throw to a question that we've got come through. We've had a few come through. Thanks for sending them through. Um, I think this one's a good one uh, from our uh, from Shard. How do you start the conversation internally? to discuss the right team operating model to maximize the success of CDP? And then additionally, is there a tested operating model that has worked effectively? Leanne, do you mind having a crack at that one? Um, so of course, we've only recently um, implemented our CDP. Um, it took us a while to implement it to get the uh, right data behind it. And we've probably been up and running, I'm gonna say for a year now. Um, we, have set up a you know a working group basically of champions that meet and discuss what our next use cases are so we're very much building a like i said in the previous question it's about collaboration between teams so it's not your it team it's not your marketing tech team it is a combination of your marketers your analytics people all coming together to come up with what is our next thing that we want to try and test um, we're probably running our operating model a bit on the fly where we try and work out how this works, but I just find having the right people involved has made it quite an easy journey for us. We also work closely with a partner of ours um, and they've been instrumental in making sure that we aren't doing things that are going to bite us in the ass down the track, if I can say that, um, just with, you know, naming them and things like that, the way we're structuring audiences and things, because, you know, what we know today is so much more than what we knew a year ago. Um, and without that additional partnership to begin with, I think we would have made a few mistakes that we'd have to unravel. Um, so it's been really good to just have those cross-functional teams and the agency support as well. Yeah, the cross-functional alignment is super important. I think um, it is difficult because, you know, with, you know, organizational changes is one part, technology changes, there's the whole change management and adoption of different technologies. So I think what we find from Telium is that, you know, organizations start with a small group and then start to expand out broadly. 
but making sure that there's stakeholders across those different departments, whether it's marketing, IT, analytics, engineering, um, and having the, the key stakeholder buy-in. Um, and then also doing readbacks and you know um, retrospectives back internally to say, what have we tried? What's working? What's not working? Um, I think there's also the support from partners to help you, you know, figure out and navigate those changes is super important. Um, I'm going to throw to one more question here, which I think is a, a great one from uh, Juanita. Uh, thanks, Juanita. What is the biggest difference between using explicit data? And I might call that, refer to that as maybe zero party data. So web form submissions or survey results or et cetera, compared to web tracking data in terms of privacy and consent, and should they start prioritizing one over the other for a bigger ROI? So I'm gonna throw that to the group if anyone wants to handle that. It's a pretty hairy question, but anyone got any thoughts on that? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think um, when we're talking zero party data, I think that's, you know, it's very useful because it, it's, it's, it's information that's freely given up by a consumer. Um, so you get kind of a really good sense of consumer behavior from that as well. Um, it's often a lot better, well, a lot better than kind of a lot of the third party data that you might get on consumers that's kind of pulled from here, there and everywhere. Um, so you get a lot of kind of really rich insight. Um, and I know, again, the, the Telium guys are uh, working a lot with kind of how we can utilize zero party data on the site through CDP to kind of create kind of audience segments or, um, start personalizing that journey. And I think from a consumer perspective as well, like yeah, you get to a website, pops up, ask you kind of, you know, hey, what are you looking for today? You just put in, oh, I'm looking for how I can enroll at such and such university. Um, you know, one, you're gonna get the answer you want quicker. So as a consumer, it's gonna be a better experience, but two, it then obviously allows the university to kind of start tailoring their content, understand what consumers are looking for on their website. So, um, Ultimately, I feel like we've not tested this out, but I would say it probably will drive a higher ROI, I think, because like I say, you're going to get much more granular in, insight into kind of what people are wanting and doing. Um, in terms of prioritizing one or the other, I think it, it's just gonna be a case of testing. You know, you test the different data sources you've got and find out what does drive the highest ROI. Um, like I say, intrinsically to me, zero party data feels like it would be better. We yet, like we haven't, like running a test to kind of show that versus kind of other first party data that we're using, but um, it just feels like you'd get a richer source of data coming out of it. Yeah, and it's probably far lesser in terms of the scale. So third party, yeah. huge scale, second party can help con uh, contribute to your own first party. First party narrows down and then you got zero party, yeah. which is you know, far less. Yeah, um, we, there was another, yeah go ahead. No, I was going to say, that's, that's a big thing. We, we Again, we speak to clients, so we always kind of frame it's like a data aperture, right? You go from kind of, large scale, not as granular to really granular and insightful, but often very small scale. And it's, it's about trying to find the balance within it to, to achieve your objectives. Yeah, that was a good question that came in in terms of a, have you implemented a strategy to segment uh, based on prospective students versus their parents or carers? And I think that zero party data is a really good tactic mm -hmm. or a strategy that you can implement to do that. So, you know, when they come to the website, they start browsing courses are you a parent or are you a prospective student? That's a simple question. And based on that, leveraging that insight to deliver more relevant, meaningful conversations and messages. Um, I don't know, is that something that anyone's looking at? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yep, it's a, very, a really important audience because it's the you know guidance officers in schools, the parents, the carers, your friends that are gonna influence you the most. Um, and we need to make sure that our parents and carers have the appropriate information for them to inform their children and um you know get to them the information they need to start harassing their kids to go hey you haven't put your application in that sort of thing so they're a really important audience um and just knowing it's great if we can segment them and yes we try to um but there is a lot of confusion over kids will use their parents email address because they don't want to hear from universities and parents will sign up as their children and so you get this confused sort of audience so it's not as easy to do as it should be um and i feel like a lot of um universities often will split the information between parents and guardians and high school students but at the end of the day, the content they're providing is still the same. So I don't think it's as nuanced as it could be. And I think that's a um, great thing that could be done well by many organisations that isn't quite done yet. 
Yeah, fantastic. Actually, maybe I can sneak it as well, Karen. Um, just because I've seen some very interesting things in that space, it also, but also put it back to consent, because uh, you've actually got some real interesting things around consent with what you share with a parent or a carer as well. So to the question, if you're not creating those segments or if you're not able to do that, it really starts to impact what you can and should be communicating. Where we've seen those segments used really well is, and again, interesting from a consent point of view, is the was in like talking about how do you impact conversion really, right? By helping a parent or a carer or an influencer to press buttons. So a really good example is, and whether this is too far down or you know, who knows, um, is someone has received an offer, has clicked through, looked at it, hasn't actually gone through and accepted it yet. A parent be able to receive a message saying, hey, did you know your child has got this and is yet to do this? How you message that is very interesting. Whether you should is another question, but be able to create the segments that allow you to do it, gathering the consent that allows you to do it um, is, is very interesting work to go through. Sorry, my mute button's got sticky. Um, I do want to ask, we've got one more question for, that was prepared and we've got a couple that have come through from the audience. Uh, my good friend Amin has asked a question. He's asked two, actually. We'll just we'll try to get to both, but we'll, we'll do our best on the first one, Amin. Uh, in what ways can CDP, uh, sorry, in what ways can CDPs help institutions understand the preferences and behaviours of prospective students to improve recruitment and enrolment strategies? I think that one might be aimed at Leanne to start with. I'm having to say mute problem. Um, CDPs can really help um, organisations like universities um, by being able to bring in that offline data and the online data. So we very much are siloed in how our data is collected, um, our student systems, our offers come out of you know, other systems than what we use for websites. Um, a lot of our applications go through tertiary um, admission centres, so they are kind of black holes for us and you want to not be telling someone to apply if they've already applied. So that customer message is really important. So being able to bring off those offline sources in um, to the customer data platform enables us to better target those messages to our students. Thanks, Leanne. Nick or Alex, anything to add on that one? I, I can. Uh, Alex will probably be able to talk this better as well, but um, you know, when we're talking to things like consent preferences as well, so obviously there's you know, consent into your data being used, but you can also kind of expand that into a preference center as well. So again, using that built within you know, the CDP that, that pushes into a CDP to understand how does this student or prospective student want to be communicated to? Is it via email? Is it via text? You can build that in and then you understand, okay, I know this person wants to be sent an email over a text message or they want to be called. Um, so again, going back to kind of that point we mentioned before around I think Alex mentioned it, you know, typically everyone reverts to email as I want to send everyone an email, so I'll send everyone an email. You can leverage technology now to understand at the point of entry how those prospective students want to be communicated to it. And then, you know, as you kind of go through, you're making sure you're speaking to them in the right way. Alex, did you want I, I can definitely maybe Yeah, I'd love to. And yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Always that's most interesting questions, Armin. Uh, one of the things I'd say is the real interesting things about CDP is how it brings lots of different data together. So understanding, and we're talking about understanding what someone has done, being able to create audiences, segments, cohorts based on behavioural patterns. Also having that data in a place, we can then use that to create models, to look at predictive, prescriptive type of analytics um, off the back of it becomes really, really interesting. So that's where we're starting to see things happen now is how do you anticipate what someone is going to do based on what you know about a range of behaviours of, of similar um, activities, as opposed to your very traditional demographic style understanding of what someone who someone is, what they might want, uh, be able to much, much more effectively leverage and combine that with the behavioural information. That's awesome. Thanks, Alex. I'm going to go to the last question now. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to summarise your some key takeaways uh, for how universities can uh, adapt and where they should start and any advice that you can provide to the audience. Um, let's kick off with Leanne first. Okay. Um, my key takeaways are be curious, 
make sure you build a good rapport with your staff, your agencies, your vendors. Um, they are the ones that will help you deliver what you need to do. Look beyond your own vertical, like education is okay in what it does with technology, but other verticals have gone much further. So we don't need to recreate the wheel, um, see what other companies doing, what really cool things they're doing that you can lift and shift um, and have fun. Like there's so much fun to have in this space. There's so much technology. There's so many new things coming out that it is constantly evolving every day. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, Nick, we'll throw to you. Yeah, I think um, where we're seeing kind of a lot of success with, with, with clients is really getting them to hone in on kind of what their kind of key business or organizational challenge is, especially when they're kind of looking at how data and technology can help solve that. Often we find the initial use case we get kind of briefed or challenged with is, you know, typically very media centric, but it's kind of a high level. But then when you start drilling down, you actually find that it's kind of much deeper. Um, and then you start kind of exploring other avenues on how to solve it. So I think if you can kind of get to that point first by engaging with the stakeholders kind of within your organization to understand, you know, what, what is it at its core? Um, and then you kind of come speak to your agencies, you know, your media agencies or, or you know, like the team at Ogilvy, it just helps them kind of understand a bit more about what the actual kind of real ask is and then kind of what the best um, path forward from there is. Last but not least. Alex? Thanks, Gary. I, to me, the biggest piece and the most exciting is the opportunity that CDP brings around people and organizations. What, what I really love about it, yes, there's a bunch of technology and data things that are great, and I, and I can touch on those, but really, it feels like sometimes it almost forces collaboration. Like Leanne was talking about all these different teams coming together. Um, people even in a, in a marketing organization who might not normally interact regularly, um, but across potentially a broader organization. That to me is the most exciting thing when we see platforms like this coming in. How do you get collaboration? And how do you then make that student or customer first? Which again, for me, this it's so interesting that a piece of technology can potentially enable you or push you in a direction to be more customer centric, student centric, or to be more collaborative um, because it almost does feel like it forces that. Um, so those are my top two. If there was something else, it would be that data piece we talked about, really making sure you're on top of what is your data strategy and that not being just first party. We've talked here about zero party as well, second party, third party, et cetera. So what is your data strategy? Really getting on top of that is massive if you're going to try and leverage technology in this space. Love it. And I love how you talk about unifying data can actually unify an organization. I think that's my takeaway from today. Um, so we're at time. Uh, I'm going to do a quick wrap. Thank you everyone to for attending uh, and the amazing panelists here today. Um, for any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, we will try to get back in touch with you. Um, and if you'd like to reach out to myself or Telium or any of the amazing panelists here today, the details are on the Bright Talk webpage. Thank you once again uh, to Alex, Leanne and Nick and for everyone for joining today. Hope you all have a great day.